This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Fear causes us to shrink back. The more fear we have, the smaller our soul becomes. It just becomes like a little dried up prune inside of us instead of feeding full of courage and life and creativity. Fear means to take flight or to run away from. That's what the word means, to take flight or to run away from. So actually, every time you see in the Bible, fear not, which is all over the Bible. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the main reason That the Bible gives for us not fearing is to know that God is with us and that if he's with us, he loves us and he will take care of us. Amen. And I'm telling you, no matter what comes down in the world in the years ahead, God loves you. He's with you and he will take care of you. And you're going to need to hang on to this because none of us know for sure what's going to happen in society. Who would have ever thought in this country Christians could be persecuted and yet we're well on our way? Amen. I mean, a young person in college today, if they stand up and declare that they're a Christian, there's no telling what they're in for. And so a lot of people then will just shrink back in fear and be quiet. I am not going to shut up because the devil is on a rampage. Jesus said, if you confess me in front of people, I will confess you in front of my Father who is in heaven. Let's don't go to church on Sunday and be a Christian and the rest of the week live in the closet. Amen. We're believers in Jesus Christ. God is good. He's alive and well. And we don't need to start acting different now just because the world says that we should. It's not politically correct anymore to talk about God out loud. Fear produces feelings of shakiness, dry mouth, heart palpitations. (laughs) It comes with thoughts of disaster and a future filled with dreadful things that God says over and over, fear not. For I am with you. Remember, we're not talking about not having the feeling of fear. We're talking about not letting it stop you. God needs faith to work with. When fear knocks on your door, send faith to answer. Fear causes us to shrink back. The more fear we have, the smaller our soul becomes. Just becomes like a little dried up prune inside of us instead of feeling full of courage and life and Creativity. Satan wants us to shrink back in fear and live little, tiny, useless lives. But God wants us to be brave and bold. And in Hebrews 10.38, the word actually says that if you shrink back in fear, God's saying, if you shrink back in fear, my soul has no delight in you. That's not what pleases God. But the just shall live by faith. My righteous servant shall live by his conviction, respecting man's relationship to God and divine things and holy fervor born of faith and conjoined with it. And if he draws back and shrinks in fear, my soul has no delight or pleasure in him. I tell the story sometimes of the first sizable speaking engagement I ever had. And there were about 900 people there that night, and it looked like 9 million to me. And I'd been invited kind of as a fluky thing because a speaker canceled and somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody knew me. So it wasn't like I was anybody's first choice. It was just kind of like, well, Joyce has left, we'll bring her. And... I was only a workshop speaker. I wasn't doing a main session. And uh, so that really kind of meant I wasn't one of the important people. And 
they had all the speakers on the front row and everybody there was a doctor and a reverend and a they all had big titles and I was just Joyce from Fenton they're like nobody from nowhere and they wanted us to the workshop speakers to get up and share what they were going to talk about in the next day to encourage let people kind of decide what workshop they wanted to come to and uh, when I got up to talk I was so scared that I couldn't get my voice to work I opened my mouth and a squeak came out <laughs> and I'm telling you what right then I wanted to run I mean the devil was shouting in my ear you need to go back to Fenton where you came from and don't ever come out of there again and I had a choice to make and all of us are going to be faced with choices in our life on a regular basis. If you want to fulfill your destiny, if you want to be all that God wants you to be, then you have to stop caring what people think. Because I can tell you right now, if you're going to do what God wants you to do, the devil is going to provide somebody that don't like it. And it may very likely be somebody that means a lot to you. Because it really doesn't bother you much if it's somebody you don't care that much about. But if it's somebody you love and somebody whose admiration you want, then it gets really hard. And to be honest, we got to be willing, if need be, to walk away from every other human being in order to have the fullness of God in our lives. John 12, 42 and 43 says that many of the Jews believed in Jesus, but they would not confess it for fear of being put out of the synagogue. Isn't that pitiful? wonder how many people there are today who would like to have a full-on, radical, outrageous relationship with God. <laughs> and yet it might not be popular in their religious circles, or it might not be popular with their friends and so they choose to keep the people happy and inside they're empty themselves you know there's a good example about what fear does to us in the story of the three stewards who were given talents from their master it's in Matthew 25. I'm not going to turn. I'll just remind you of it. And the three of these men were each given different amounts of talent according to their ability to handle them. It's interesting that God never gives us more than what we can handle. But he does expect us to do something with what he has given us. Amen. And I'll tell you what, there was a lot of talents I didn't have, but I could talk. And I'm maximizing that gift. <laughs> and so one, so one man was given five talents and he went and invested those five. And when the master came back to take an accounting, he gave him back his five plus five more. And the master said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The second man received two talents. He invested them and brought the master back two more. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. But the man who got one actually proved that he didn't even, couldn't even really handle the one, although God gave him an opportunity because when the master came back, he said, I hid I was afraid and I hid your talent and he didn't get a pat on the back oh I'm so sorry you had that fear in your life I mean he was rebuked by Jesus you wicked lazy idle servant <laughs> and he took away from him the one that he had and gave it to somebody else so here's the bottom line you use it or you lose it Amen. And so we can't live our lives in fear 
and dread of what's going on and what's going to happen. Now, this is a time for us to begin to use our talents. Because every one of you, every single one of you has something to contribute in society. Every one of you has a ministry. Every one of you has an anointing from God. I said every one of you has a ministry. <laughs> and I just, I just love to think about what could happen if every believer really understood who they are in Christ and what they have to contribute and we would stop shrinking back in fear and we would just get out in the midst of our world, your neighborhood, where you go to the marketplace, where you shop, where you go to school, where you go to church and we would simply do what the Bible says, let your light shine. Whatever, stop worrying about what you can't do and start using what you can do. Come on, think, think, think and get a little bit creative about what you can do to help somebody else. Every day of my life, I pray that God will use me to make somebody else's life better. Every morning, I pray that God will put somebody in front of me that I can help, somebody that I can be a blessing to. And I'm not talking about on TV or in the pulpit. I'm talking about me personally as I'm out and about in my world. Who can I help and who can I bless? Let your light shine before men. That they might see your good works and what glorify your Father who is in heaven. The reason why people disrespect Christianity and why so many people are falling away from God is because they don't see Christians behaving like Christians. Amen. And we are in desperate times. Desperate times. The time is short. The hour is late. And Jesus said, we must be working the works of God while there's still daylight and we can. Amen. Amen. You're the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its flavor, how can its saltiness be restored? It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trodden under foot. I don't want to be a good for nothing Christian. I don't want to just have a bumper sticker on my car and while I speed down the highway and (laughs) you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a peck measure, but on a lampstand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your moral excellence and your praiseworthy, noble, and good deeds and recognize and honor and praise and glorify your Father who is in heaven. But you know the thing I really like about those verses right before that, the two verses before I started in 13, they're all talking about how we're blessed when we're persecuted for Christ's sake. So that's exactly what we're talking about today for the times that we're in. Blessed are those who are persecuted for Christ's sake. For great is their reward in heaven. Oh, and by the way, remember, you're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. So get out there and let your light shine even in the midst of persecution. And you know, for some of you, persecution just amounts to maybe your friends not wanting to hang out with you anymore because you become a radical on fire Christian. How many of you have found that your friends are not all happy for you when you get hooked up with Jesus? To be honest with you, that's pretty much everybody's experience. That's one of the things the enemy uses. Now, I would like us to look at Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6. Let your character or your moral disposition be free from the love of money, including greed, avarice, lust, 
and craving after earthly possessions and be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have. For he, God himself, has said, are you ready for this? I will not in any way fail you nor give you up nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not. I will not in any degree leave you helpless. I will not forsake you nor let you down. I will not relax my hold on you, most assuredly not. And verse 6. So we take courage and we are encouraged and we confidently and boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can man do unto me? Amen. Can I tell you, if you lose a friend over your relationship with God, you'll survive. Now, I want to talk to you about confrontation. Because one of the things that we need to do if we're going to live bold, courageous lives is be willing to confront the things that we need to confront. If I said to you today, how many of you don't like confrontation, who would put their hand up? (laughs) Well, I mean, who really does, you know? I mean, I'm kind of a bulldog, and it might be easier for me than some people, but I don't like it either. I don't like making people mad. I don't like hurting people, and I don't like it when people don't like me. None of us do. And so really, for all intent and purposes, I don't think any of us are in love with confrontation. It seems like people either confront too quickly without even thinking about what they're going to say. I may have that problem, Or we just don't confront at all. And so, just a few things I want to remind you of. Always be willing to confront people that are trying to control you or manipulate you. And the world's full of them. All the enemy has to find is somebody that he can work through. Because he is a controller and a manipulator. My father was a controller and a manipulator. There's nothing worse than having somebody always trying to run your life for you where you never have any freedom and you're constantly being told how to act, what to say, what to do. And the longer you let a relationship like that go on, the harder it is to get out of it. And some of you have already got a pretty big problem. And I want to encourage you today that you have to make a change and you have to start confronting things because Jesus died to make us free. He whom the Son has set free is really, truly, and genuinely free. And the only person that should be controlling us is the Holy Spirit. And I'm not talking about being rebellious and not submitting to authority. That's not what I mean. We all need to know how to submit to the right authority that God puts over us. But I am talking about when somebody's trying to manipulate you and control you, and they're always trying to make you do what they think you should do. Galatians 1.10, Paul said, If I were trying to be popular with people, I would not now be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is so good. And I can actually say, if I were just only cared about being popular with people, which I do want to people to like me, but if that was all that concerned me, I wouldn't be here today. And many of you are borderline on missing your destiny because you're overly concerned about what people think. And you know what? Haters are going to hate and complainers are going to complain. And if they're picking on you, at least they're leaving somebody else alone. (laughs) Jesus made himself of no reputation. He got that over the quick so he could go ahead and do what God sent him to do. And there was always some Pharisee watching to accuse. But I tell you, when you know who you are in Christ, then you don't have to be overly concerned about the accusations of other people. That's part of being courageous. In Acts 5.29, I went to a church one time and the pastor, I think, preached on this for three months. And so I'll never forget Acts 5.29. We must obey God rather than man. 
And these, these apostles were being threatened with jail and they'd been told not to preach in that name. And if you do, you're going to be beaten and you're going to be put in jail. And here they are out preaching. <laughs> and when they came to him and said, we told you not to do that. They said, we must obey God rather than man. Come on, that's a good scripture for you to hang on to. We must obey God rather than man. Let me tell you something. If you're left with nobody but God, you still got the best deal. Don't give up your relationship with him to keep a bunch of people that probably don't care anything about you anyway. Confront your past. My father sexually abused me and it was like the big secret in the house. It was like the elephant in the room. It was like everybody knew but nobody talked. My mother knew because she had caught him at one time. I told her when I was nine. But she was cowardly. She didn't know how to face the scandal. Nobody talked about something like that that many years ago. And, of course, he lied to her, and she was afraid of him because he was violent. Bottom line is, her fear destroyed her life, really hurt mine, destroyed my brother's life, and actually did not help my father. Sometimes you can help people be free from something if you'll confront them and not just let them keep getting by with it. But the bottom line is, it was just like... We didn't talk about it. Well, I left home when I was 18 thinking that I was going to get away from the problem. But the problem was I took the problem with me. It was just in my soul. Just getting away from something doesn't mean it's over. You got to deal with it. But I believe that it was necessary for me to confront that place of fear in my life because I had lived my whole life in fear of him. And Dave would even tell me after we got married and been married a few years, he said, when you're, when you're, when we go to your mom and dad's house or, or your dad comes around, he said, you, you become like a different person. You act different. Well, when you don't deal with those things that are in your soul, you do act different. And for some of you, confronting your past may be as simple as sitting down with a trusted friend and talking about something that you did a long time ago that still bothers you or talking about something that somebody did to you a long time ago that still bothers you. You know how many people there are that were abused in their childhood that are 50 and 60 and 70 years old and have never told anybody? And if you believe you're totally free from it, I'm not telling you you have to do anything, but I'm just saying we need to have safe friends that will keep our secrets that we can talk to because sometimes you just need to vent. Come on. We just need to be able to tell somebody this, this, that, and something else. And then we need to learn how to confront problems between us and other people and do it in a biblical, godly way. Do you know that one or two sentences of straightforward communication can solve so many problems? Because a lot of times we're thinking that they're thinking and they're not thinking at all. So we're acting weird toward them because we think they're thinking. <laughs> And so it's better just to say, are you thinking? Huh? No. <laughs> but you know why we don't do that? We don't want anybody to think we're silly. And so don't be afraid to ask. Who cares if they think you're silly? Most of the time, it really has nothing to do with you at all. So many problems are caused because when you have a problem with someone, instead of going to them, you go to a bunch of other people, which then becomes gossip and it spreads strife. We try to teach people in our office this. 
If you're having a problem with somebody in your department, do what the Bible says and go first to your brother privately. If your brother wrongs you, go and show him his fault between you and him privately. Privately. Come on. And if he listens, you've won back your brother. And then it goes on to say, if he doesn't listen, then you can take a couple of others with you. The whole point is you're trying to restore him, not ruin his reputation. But invariably what happens is because people don't want to confront, come on, this is good. They'll go to somebody else and actually make the problem worse. Now boy, we need to stop doing that. Don't be the kind of person that's afraid to confront things. Do what you need to do and let God give you victory in your life. Need help facing your fears? God wants you to know today that he is going to always take care of you if you keep your trust in him. Learn how to face fear and find freedom with four teachings from Joyce. Discover what happens when you run from your fear and how to do it afraid. You can get these resources today by simply using the information on your screen. Or you can visit us online at JoyceMeyer.org. We have four boys, so our house is very busy, never a dull moment. See, my two older boys, they get along most of the time, but there was a season where they were just getting on each other's nerves and just there was like battles I felt like all the time well I know in my own life the importance of God's word and what a difference it makes so when we started school this year I decided that that's what I want our day to start with is being in the word of God and so we've tried a bunch of different devotionals I feel like a lot of them were either written more for adults or for really little kids until we got the best day ever the boys understand what it's saying, and it's very like easy to apply to whatever is happening in our daily life. I would say probably after a week of doing it, I noticed, I'm like, hey, there's not as much bickering going on. Like They're being kind to each other. And so just being in the Word of God made a huge difference. Well, here at Joyce Meyer Ministries, we strive to show Christ's love in practical ways. The sharing of the gospel digging water wells for people who don't have clean water, building homes for people that have lost theirs in disasters. You know, I feel like we're one big family, and that includes those of you that are our partners, and we're taking care of one another. You and I help each other, and then we help people that don't have anybody to help them. So I'm encouraging you to become a partner with the ministry if you're not one. I'm asking you to become a partner with us. We need you. And I believe that you need us. I believe we all need to be part of something that's bigger than what we are just by ourselves. You can become part of the family, and we will take care of you. We pray for you, and we offer free resources. It's a beautiful cycle of caring for one another. So join the family and help us reach out to more hurting people, and the blessings of God will multiply in your life. For more information, visit JoyceMeyer.org. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries.